This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. This year, billions of cicadas will emerge as the regular annual variety will be joined by brood 19 and brood 13, species that pop up every 13 and 17 years, emerging at the same time for the first time since 1803. We are joined by Alan Moore, experienced administrator, researcher, educator, and division director in the Division of Environmental Biology at the U.S. National Science Foundation to learn more about these mysterious insects. Dr. Moore, thank you for joining us today. I want to start by asking you, what are cicadas and why is everyone excited about their emergence this year? So cicadas are insects that live underground for most of their life. And when they come out from underground as adults, they climb up a tree, mate, lay eggs, and those eggs develop, go back underground, and then come out again later. Most cicadas only come out every year, but this year we have this very unusual in that we have some cicadas that come out occasionally, 13 years or 17 years, and for the first time in 221 years, both the 13 and the 17-year cicadas are coming out at the same time. 221 years. The last time this happened, Thomas Jefferson was president. That kind of puts it in perspective. It's not going to happen again for another 221 years. So this kind of makes a solar eclipse, puts it in its own shadow. This is really an exciting event because it happens so irregularly. But it's a natural event. We know when it's going to happen again. We knew when it happened last. And that's the fun part of nature, the predictability and the unpredictability at the same time. Where do they live? So cicadas live underground. They feed by sucking the phloem or the, the juice from trees. And they live in the roots of the trees, attach to the roots of the trees. And they're big insects. They're about an inch long. And so they take a long time to develop. That and phloem isn't really all that nutritious, so it takes a long time to become that big of an insect. So once they get enough that they're large enough, they come out. Normally that happens ir irregularly for different kinds of cicadas, but then there are these special cicadas called periodical cicadas that time their, their emergence coming out all at the same time. We think of cicadas in the United States as mostly a southern and eastern insect. Why might an insect have a limited geographic distribution as opposed to something like spotted lanternflies or other invasive species? It probably has a lot to do with what they eat. If they're specialized on certain plants or, certain, in this case, certain trees, they can't go where the trees aren't. They have to live with the trees. An invasive species generally tends to be able to use a lot of different things. It tends to have a shorter lifespan. Something that, that lives underground for 13 or 17 years, it's unlikely to travel very far. And so it's much more limited in its distribution. I know we have annual cicadas, but what is a periodical brood? First of all, not all cicadas are periodical. Some come out every year. So you may hear cicadas singing year after year after year, and you think, well, why is that? What happened to my periodical cicadas? Periodical cicadas are cicadas that all come out all at the same time every 13 years or every 17 years. And so these are insects that don't just come out when they're ready. They wait 13 years or 17 years before they go. That's a long time for an insect. And so the question that everyone has is, well, why is that happening? Why do they only come out 13 or 17 years? So having been through a couple cicada seasons at this point, I've noticed that their wings or eye color might differ a little bit from brood to brood. And I'm wondering, why do insects develop color distinctions across similar species? Yeah, so color in insects is developed in a couple different ways. One, color comes from what they eat. So they, they take their food and they convert it into colors called carotenoids. They get carotenoids from their food. They make red or yellow, very common colors in insects. The other insect colors that you see are black, brown. Those, they make themselves from something called melanin. And then finally, the really beautiful colors like greens and, and blues and things like that are structural. That means that their cuticle is shaped in such a way that they reflect the light to create that color. So it depends on how they're making their color. But generally, the way that insects make color will run uh, amongst related families and groups. I want to ask you a follow-up. You mentioned color structure, and I'm thinking about some beetles or cuckoo wasps that have this kind of metallic sheen color. Are those kinds of colors similar? Yeah. So the insects can mix all these together. You can have melanin-based 
crown node based and structural based colors all at the same time. The really bright colors and the metallic colors, those are generally structural and, and reflect. There are some common colors in insects, black and red, for example, come together a lot. And that's just nature's way of saying, don't eat me. I taste bad or I'm bad for you. I might be poisonous. Black and red generally is a bad, bad color combination. Uh, other things that you'll have insects that'll look like wasps that aren't wasps or bees that look like bees but aren't bees. And that's another way of hiding what they are because you don't want to eat a bee. Uh, and so you avoid things. So they make colors for different reasons. But a lot of times they make bright colors just because it attracts the opposite sex, makes them pretty. Why do periodical cicadas emerge every 13 or 17 years? Is there a benefit to this cycle? This is the great question that no one has a really good answer to. So the 13 and 17 years, we don't know why those numbers. There are some guesses as to why they all come out at the same time. We're talking about trillion insects over a really wide area. So 13 years, if you're a bird, you're not going to wait around 13 years for your next meal. So you don't learn to use cicadas as a typical diet, or 17 years for sure. Maybe mammals might live that long, but again, they're not going to wait 17 years to eat. So we think that it's a protection against predators. The coming out all at once is that, well, if you're going to come out every 13 or 17 years, you still have to live. One of the ways to do that is to hide in a group. When you have a mass emergence all at once, the predators can't eat them all. And so some uh, cicadas will, will survive just because of the numbers. So we think that the timing of the brood emergence and coming out all as a mass brood, the periodical broods, is, is a mechanism to avoid predation. Why 17 and why 13 years? That's the question. Those are prime numbers. They can't be divided by anything else. We don't know if that matters. We don't know if that's important. But you know, it's a really hard thing to study. It's not a great thing to put your career on studying something every 17 years. So as they come out, that's why scientists get all excited. We get to try and figure out, maybe we'll figure out this time why they spent 13 and 17 years. What do they do after emerging? That's a great question too. Everyone worries about these are big, loud insects, right? They're kind of scary looking, they have bright red eyes. They look a little bit like aliens. So what are they doing? And the answer is just mating. Do they bite? Do they sting? Nope. Do they do anything to hurt you? No. Do they hurt your plants? Are they feeding on your plants? No. The only thing that the cicadas feed on are trees, and they feed on the roots of trees as nymphs. The adults come out, the adults aren't going to feed. All they're looking for is a mate. The female lays the eggs in the, in the trees, in the uh, branches of the trees. And once those eggs hatch, the larvae drop down to the ground and burrow underground and wait another 13 or 17 years to come out again. So really, all you're seeing is a musical symphony of really excited males and females. And it's only the males that are singing to the females. The females will go find the males. I think the females can't hear very well because they seem to be so loud. But the females go find the males, uh, and that's all they're looking for is to mate and reproduce. How long do cicadas live? Not very long. So here's an insect that's living underground for 13 or 17 years. You think, how long are they going to live when they get out? A few days. Because they don't eat, all they're looking for is to mate. They're not going to live a long time. They're going to mate, and then they'll die, and the cycle starts over again. So it's only a few days that they're really above ground. But there are so many of them, the brood emergence will last for six weeks or so. It feels like they're around for a long time. Are there any other kinds of insects that follow this kind of long breeding cycle. Another example that people that are, are fly fishermen might be aware of is something like a mayfly. So you'll see the mayflies come out, they live in the water, all of a sudden they all come out and all the fish get very excited because those are good eats. And the fishermen also use the mayflies as a sign that the fish are ready to uh, looking for food. But when those mayflies come out, they don't feed either. They've only fed when they're young and they only come out, they mate and then they die. So yeah, it's not a terribly uncommon pattern for insects. Do cicadas provide any benefits? Well, you know, actually, yes. So cicadas are like chicken nuggets for birds. I mean, this is good eats. We're going to have a really good bird population, a really good mammal population. So if you like wildlife, the cicadas really are going to make those populations thrive this year because there's a lot of good food around. But the other thing is that people fail to realize is as they burrow out of ground, they're aerating the ground. And so they're, they're mixing up the soil, keeping it healthy, and that provides a benefit 
for other things to grow. So yeah, there are some some benefits. They don't do a lot other than be food for other animals and aerate the ground, but they do enough to play their part. You mentioned cicada song, and and personally, it's something that drives me insane during that season. And I know you've studied cricket song, and I was wondering if there might be some similar kind of point to it or a similar way they're using it. So I wanted to ask you, what can you tell us about cricket song? Crickets and cicadas, they're both insects, but they're different kinds of insects. So cicadas are unusual in the way they make their sound is they use something that's like a drum. They have a a muscle attached to it, and they pull it back and release it really quickly, and it makes a a timpani-type sound. More commonly are things like crickets and, and grasshoppers, and they make sound like a guitar. They, they rub two bits of parts together, typically their wings, where they have what's called a scraper and a file. Another way to think about it is if you ever took a comb and you run your finger along a comb, it's that kind of sound-making process. So the two different ways of making sound, but they're making sound for the same reason. It's the male singing to the female, trying to attract her, trying to have her come over, and so that they can reproduce and produce eggs and continue on. I want to go back a little bit for this next question and ask you about how your NSF postdoctoral fellowship in environmental biology, uh, how did that experience impact your career? Yeah, the postdoctoral fellowship was one of the best things that ever happened to me. So getting started, when you're really just beginning, you might have great research ideas, you might have great training, you might be doing really clever things, but you don't have any external validation of that other than maybe papers. By getting this postdoctoral fellowship, It was experts in my field saying, this is somebody who has ideas we want to see pursued. And it wasn't my mentors. It wasn't the people that are retaining me. These are people that I didn't know, just in the field at general. So what NSF does is give us a stamp of approval. You have ideas that are good enough that we would give you money to see you do those ideas. That was my first funding from NSF. Uh, I've been fortunate to be funded from NSF since then, but it really kickstarts your career and gives you that seal of approval. You're a division director here at NSF now, and I want to ask you for a final question about your research career. Yeah, my research focuses on social interactions, mating, parenting, and insects. And what we're really interested in are what are the genes that are turned on and off to allow that to happen. Most of the time, Most insects aren't mating. Most of the time, most insects aren't taking care of babies. And so what genetic changes occur in order to let that occur? Uh, So that's our our primary focus of of what we look at. I'm an evolutionary biologist, so really what I'm looking for are the commonalities across different insects, but not just insects, mammals and birds and even humans. Special thanks to Alan Moore. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And if you like our program, share with a friend and consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov. 